What kind of a mess do I have going here? This is just about as much fun as we can have at EVTV. Over here is a uh, early Model 3 uh, 75 kilowatt battery um, with our controller that is connected to the battery and has uh, closed the battery contact simulated um, being in the car. And the output of the controller goes over here to a junction box, which uh, all these batteries go to. And they go from that to, uh, they're all in parallel, but these two Model S batteries are off. Um, and it goes from there over to all three of our um, um, Sandy uh, inverters. These are 300 to 400 volt input inverters, actually 200 to 400 volts. <clears throat> and the one we're using right now is this uh, SDEX 20 kilowatt. It's a 20 kilowatt explosion proof inverter that will do uh, 200 to 400 volts input and uh, 20 kilowatts of output. And that's uh, how we ride here. I also have over here a 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger that is connected with a CAN cable to uh, our controller, uh, our Model 3 battery controller prototype, and of course to 240 volts AC, and then the output is again to the junction box. And that allows me to take 240 volts AC and to charge it up to our charge cutoff, the battery at up to 6.6 .6 kilowatts. And why would I want to do that when I got a 10 kilowatt charger in the battery? Well, the 10 kilowatt charger in the battery would require the um, Model 3 charge port cable um, with charge port, the Model 3 uh, charging computer, some additional wiring and software, and I just don't need it. Our little Elcon. 6.6 .6 kilowatt chargers work fine. I already have the code to control them in the software. And um, so, you know, we just don't, at this point, really want to fool with it. It's kind of an interesting project, but then you'd have to plug it in to a Tesla um, charging station, which is another $550. And so it just winds up being a lot of expense. The Tesla charge station, the, the Model 3 com charge computer and cable, uh, the three of them uh, added together are more money than this 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger, which we already know how to use. And so it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense at this point. You know, maybe we'll tackle that if there's any demand for it, but basically there isn't. Here's our display that we have right now. And this is showing me that we're down to about 28.5% and discharging at 2.73 kilowatts. Um, we're 340.8 volts. We're averaging 3.555 volts per cell. And um, uh, discharging at 6 amps. Now understand this setup is um, actually kind of the way I would like to do things in a perfect world. And why is that? Much lighter cabling, everything is much easier, much less heat because we're at 340 volts right now and 6 amps to make two and a half kilowatts. Um, to make 20 kilowatts, 
would be 50 amps. Our 48 volt systems with the Signaneers to do that kind of power would be 400 amps. And so the problem is that the high voltage inverters are much more expensive than the more commonly available 48 volt inverters. And, um, and, and, but they're also available in much larger sizes. I can get a 30 kilowatt or a 50 kilowatt one of these Sandys. <laughs> and it's feasible to feed them because the current's required at 400 volts is simply much less than at 48 volts. So this is how I think point of use generation and storage of power should work. And we have um, um, tested this uh, with the charging from the in-phase and solar edge microinverters or grid interactive inverters, and it works perfectly. There are a couple of problems. This, uh, we've largely solved them, same way as we did the Signeer. It's a little box with some switches on it, but actually it has relays in there. We have some dry contacts, Sandy built into it for us to turn on and off the uh, inverter. And uh, this one um, causes it to shift frequency from 60 to 62 and a half hertz, just like on the Signeer. And in that way, we can uh, shut down the uh, microinverter outputs and stop charging uh, when the battery gets full. Or if we go over about 50 amps, we're getting pretty close to what this can do, and we'll do the same thing. There is a disadvantage to this uh, inverter. It uses a really nice single Mitsubishi IGBT. If we disconnect the battery from the inverter while it's charging from, uh, back through the inverter to the battery from the microinverters, it blows this puppy high, sky high. That's about 350 bucks for one of them. There's also a bypass resistor in there of no particular import. I think it's 50 ohms at 100 watts. And it crispies that too, for some reason. Uh, so we've simply taken extra care in our software where anything we can conceive of where the contactors would open, it would first send that frequency shift to the microinverters to shut them down. We'll see how that goes. But we've blown a couple of those IGBTs playing around with it. And fortunately, that we can get those on Amazon. We don't even have to send to China for them. But uh, we've repaired this one twice already. And we don't seem to have that problem with the 48 volt Signeer inverters. Uh, one problem we do have with the Signeers is when you're right at the solar panels producing almost exactly what your loads require. Our LED lights in the shop, and only the LED lights flicker. For some reason with the Sandy, we don't have that at all ever. Uh, it's just not an issue. So pretty good setup, and that's what we're using to test um, with the uh, Model 3 battery. This particular battery does produce the um, uh, CAN message ID 401, which gives us individual cell data. <laughs> now we get another CAN message with the current and the voltage of the pack. So that data isn't precisely needed, but it would be nice to have. And so uh, we've got two more batteries. Um, that we can uh, look at um, that have the newer firmware that does not produce the 401k. Before we look at that, 
let's have a look at our software here uh, that we've kind of developed. It was uh, sort of the same software that we were using for our 48 volt Model S module controller, but heavily revised, of course, to actually work the Model 3 full pack. And uh, let's take a look at that. Okay, we're here with our uh, Tesla Model 3 full pack um, prototype controller. And this is the uh, a VNC screen of the display as you can see we're at 86 percent state of charge we're charging at about 10 kilowatt hours and we're at 4.15 volts um, yeah 4.15 about our average is 4.14 uh, all nicely balanced and you can see up here our uh, charging power uh, over the last 90 minutes as it varies with the sunlight because this charging is coming from both the solar edge and the in phase um, uh, photovoltaics we have 40 in phase panels putting out 8,088 watts and uh, let's see here this is our sense display of the solar edge side which is currently putting out a little over 15 kilowatts and that should give us about 23 kilowatts we're charging a car and running the shop on the difference and uh, so that's uh, what's going on there. Uh, we've got good sunshine today. We're using our Sandy SDEX 20 kilowatt inverter. This is in a kind of an armored uh, explosion proof um, case. Uh, but we've had them do a couple of things for us on this. We have a... Uh, couple of uh, just dry contacts that we have relays connected to one of them lets us turn it off and on and one of them uh, lets us shift the frequency to 62 and a half Hertz we're using the heat enable output of the um, prototype controller to do a 500 millisecond frequency shift if the uh, inbound current to the battery exceeds oh, 50 amps for two minutes or 55 amps for 30 seconds or 60 amps for five seconds I think or if we get to our cutoff voltage of 4.2 volts and what that does is cause the inverter to shift the frequency from 60 to 62 and a half Hertz um, for half a second and that uh, shuts down our uh, uh, grid tied inverters for a period of five minutes and then they come back up so um, a couple of things about this kind of deja vu all over again I started out doing the Tesla full pack and everybody wanted the modules for 48 volts well that leads to some horrendous currents um, 15 kilowatts well 20 kilowatts is about 416 amps DC and so 15 kilowatts which is the largest Signier inverter uh, runs uh, 325 amps perhaps and that's a tremendous amount of current you have to have heavy cables and uh, bars we're using one aught cable on the model 3 because as you can see we're charging at 10 kilowatts that's a 24 25 amps uh, of DC and so these large uh, high voltage um, using the native voltage of the full electric vehicle pack 
um, simply results in much more manageable currents, cable sizes, and so forth. So I think that's the way to do it. Unfortunately, all the solar equipment people want to use because it's inexpensive and readily available here in the States, um, uses 48 volts now. Um, some still 24, 36, but most of it's gone to 48 volts. For the same reason, it's, it's lower current at 48 than it is at 24, but it kind of misses the point. And so we see a future with really high voltage comparatively high voltage, 300 to 400 volt uh, packs that are used with cars to be the uh, proper storage element for um, the uh, uh, solar energy storage. Um, it just it makes everything uh, about the rest of the system easier. Our Sandy inverter has one uh, flaw I really don't like, and that is if we cut off the battery right now for whatever reason, um, while we're charging it using the microgrid inverters, um, it blows up. It has a uh, Mitsubishi IGBT in it. It's about 350 bucks, and a uh, little 100 ohm 100 watt bypass resistor um, and we have to replace both of those every time that happens so I'm not sure it's a viable option then too the sandy inverters um, seem to be subject to a 25 percent solar equipment tariff um, from the US government at the moment where the Signeer inverters, um, we um, are not seeing that. Um, they ship them to the states. I guess they pay the tariff, and then they uh, sell them to us from somewhere here in the United States. The Sandy inverter is also about five times the cost of the Signeer. So we've done well with the Signeer at 48 volts, but this is really how I prefer to deal with it is with higher voltage we're at 399 volts now um, and charging at close to 12 kilowatts and that's 30 amps little one aug or one aug cable I think we're using one aug actually um, is plenty big uh, to carry 30 amps of, of DC current um, so it just makes everything easier so our model 3 investigation is going well it hasn't been entirely flawless um we had a situation where it would quit charging um using our standard charger at 17 amps uh in about six and a half minutes and we found out that it was a simple, easy-to-fix can error that we were making. And we changed one bit in a can message, and um, it all got better. Um, but there continue to be things to uh, look for there. Uh, again, I said that uh, um, we had some issue with uh, older batteries, such as this one, putting out a 401 hexadecimal message ID containing the individual battery voltages and the later batteries not. And I said there must be some way for them to get that information if they wanted it, but we didn't know what the uh, series was. Um, Colin actually broke down the computer from our first rec, Model 3, and dumped the uh, firmware and found um, um, the JSON, the JavaScript um, standard text 
representation of uh, most of the CAN messages in the Model 3 um, and found that um, it was using UDS requests to get the uh, individual voltages um, in a sequence and um, he's written me a bit of code uh, to do that and we should have two newer batteries here this week um, to let us uh, uh, examine that and be able to retrieve individual cell data even without the previous uh, 401 message ID. So we are still piecing through this uh, but appear to be winning an inch at a time. Um, we have to do a little surgery on the batteries and because of the various firmwares out there we want to test our controller with the batteries and so uh, at least initially we're going to offer the uh, controller and the battery as a package and that's up in the website now all right what I have here is a newer version of the Model 3 battery pack. In fact, the serial number here is TG118294 aught 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 SXS. As I described earlier, the original uh, Tesla battery put out um, a um, CAN message message ID uh, 401 in hexadecimal that um, appeared periodically about once every hundred milliseconds I think uh, and it took quite a few of them because each carried a couple or three cell voltages and so it could take quite a while to accumulate the cell voltages for display we don't have to have those to have a useful controller. However, it's a very comforting to be able to see the individual cell voltages. And in troubleshooting, if your battery quits and it won't close the contactors, you'll still get CAN messaging from the uh, uh, high voltage battery uh, control module. And so uh, if we could get cell voltages, oftentimes you can see what happened and, and what the cause is. Not a lot you can do about it with a full pack, but it might be useful information. If you had a full pack go bad and had to, uh, uh, for example, uh, retrieve uh, what modules were still good and, uh, and know which ones that were, was. So it would be nice to have individual cell data from the newer batteries. Uh, thanks to uh, the brilliance of our uh, software architect, Colin Kidder, um, we've been able to figure out how to uh, get cell voltages from the newer batteries. Recall I said that my thinking was that we sent something that they had eliminated that 401 message, which simply caused a lot of needless traffic most of the time. Uh, but in a diagnosis type situation, uh, it would obviously Tesla would be very interested in looking at the individual cell data before, for example, replacing a battery pack. And so this information has to be available. It has to come from the high voltage battery controller. And so I felt that we were doing something um, to retrieve that data from the, the computer in the car um, when using diagnostics. Um, that turns out to be exactly the case. <coughs> CAN, Bosch's controller area network, if you're familiar with the Open Systems Interconnect conceptual model of networking, the OSI model, 
can occupies layer one and two, layer one being the physical data link connection, and two being the protocol for passing data. Uh, there's actually seven layers. This, the seventh or high, highest level would be your application programming interface, where a specific application program uh, interface to the OSI networking model to get information. It's proven to be a very durable and um, useful conceptual model in networking uh, for two or three decades now. And so um, we refer to it quite a bit. Um, there is a service for automobiles and it's termed the Unified, uh, Unified Diagnostic Services or Universal Diagnostic Services, UDS. And UDS uses CAN, but it's a higher level protocol. And its main functions, uh, it has um, eight or 10 modes um, that it, that it uses at a technical level, but it has two main functions in UDS. One is to um, allow you to flash new software into um, microcontrollers in the car. And this is how Tesla would flash new software into the inverter of the drive unit, or in this case, new software into the um, controller for the high voltage battery. The second use is um, somewhat more useful, and that is to retrieve fault data stored in microcontrollers in devices on the car. And so you could query the drive unit or the air conditioner, or in this case, the battery for additional data relating to failures or operational statistics. And in fact, this is what uh, uh, we worked out was the case with the missing cell data was uh, we needed a um, um, identify by ID type request, a UDS request over CAN to the um, high voltage um, controller and it would then provide or respond with the individual cell data. The interesting thing about the way Colin did it is the time between these messages to get the cell data <laughs> is three milliseconds. And I was pretty sure that was going to overrun my incoming CAN check, but actually it doesn't. It works just fine. And so we can get individual cell data very quickly. And more importantly, um, with um, just a little tweaking of my battery object module for the Model 3, um, I can respond to batteries that issue the 401 uh, CAN message or uh, query and process responses um, over UDS, depending on which type of battery it detects. And so I'm very happy to report that what this does for us going forward is that we will not only be able to control, but to display individual cell data voltages uh, from all the cells in the battery for any of the current Model 3 batteries and probably for Model 3 batteries going into the future. As I said, it's not absolutely necessary to have that data to operate the battery, get it to close its internal contactors, make power available to us, um, and open those contactors um, under command. But um, it is certainly nice to have. 
we're going to have a controller that uses the battery management system in the Tesla Model 3 battery, we should be able to read the individual cell data. And Colin whipped out a very small piece of code to illustrate that within a few days. And I've already incorporated it into our uh, uh, larger program for the controller in less than that. And it's, it works perfectly. And so we have individual cell data that we can put on the screen. And simply as a vanity, one of the reasons I wanted this was our display displays individual cell data if we send it. And we do. Uh, and I haven't had to make any changes to the display itself. This is the same display we use for our uh, Tesla Model S controller with no changes at all. And we simply tailored the software in a Model 3 uh, controller to feed this um, what it needs. And so all the features that were in the display still are. We can still use MQTT over the Amazon AWS system to um, portray this uh, remotely and um, so forth. Um, and so we're trying to keep the two um, groups of hardware and software. If you'll notice our controller prototype, there is some differences because we have to be able to connect to the control connector on the Model 3 and of course plug in to the power connector on the Model 3. Uh, but other than that, it's very similar to the operation of the um, uh, our regular V2 controller for the Tesla Model S modules. And so we're trying to keep things as consistent as we can. Um, but we have cracked the uh, uh, individual cell data, cell voltage data for the newer uh, Tesla Model 3 batteries. And as I said, going forward, then we expect to be able to use uh, just about any battery um, possible. We got two of these uh, batteries, and the second one, uh, which appears to be older than this battery uh, and younger than our original battery we started with, uh, but I'm having some problem reading current. And we've changed the current sensor and are looking at hardware in the penthouse right now as being the culprit. But uh, for some reason, I get over 5,000 amps of current uh, when it's sitting still. So we still have work to do with the Model 3, testing to do with the Model 3. And Richard apparently has already sold uh, two of these Model 3 batteries and controllers to a gentleman in Virginia. I have put it in the web store, but uh, we continue to develop the software and, um, and we continue to test um, with the Model 3 and in, in a real world uh, solar charging and, and inverting uh, situation. And I'm pleased to report it's going extremely well. Of course, like our V2 controller, we have an over-the-air update function where you can get into the controller with a laptop and a ASCII screen and enter update equals one, I think, and it will go out to Amazon and get our latest version of the software and download it and substitute it for the version that's in there. So even after you get your Model 3 and controller, you can literally update it at any point in time. Uh, with that simple command, it'll go out and get the latest one I'm using um, off of Oz. And uh, again, this requires a uh, access point uh, to communicate between the controller and the display. And the access point has to be connected to the internet if you want to do MQTT 
or over-the-air updates of your controller. But that's uh, pretty much uh, where it's gone. Stay with us. Uh, we're very excited about the Model 3 battery, um, largely because Tesla is going to make a lot more Model 3 batteries than they ever made of Model S or Model X. And going forward, we should have uh, a plentitude of Model 3 batteries from Salvage, and hopefully at ever lower prices uh, as we go forward in time and they make more Teslas and the owners wreck more of them. That's the excitement about the Model 3 over the Model S or X. Is it simply destined to be more of them? And I would be very surprised if the Model Y battery is in any way significantly different from the, the Model 3. All right, that's uh, pretty much what we're doing with the uh, Model 3. Um, I did want to talk a little bit uh, largely at the request of many of you about um, the Tesla stock and the stock market. I am not a stock analyst and I don't play one on TV. I can tell you that I've done pretty well over the last about 30 years um, with uh, very disruptive technology stocks. And I think about 90% of the money that's been made in the stock market in that period has come from that area. I'm actually a fantastic stock picker. My timing can be a little rough because I kind of ride through the world about three or four years ahead of the rest of you. And that causes me some problems. Um, I've never been a very patient uh, person, and I tend to see things somewhat out ahead. That said, and I don't talk about stocks very much, and so I think that people think I don't know anything about it, and, uh, and I'm guessing I'm not. When I speak on the topic, it's for those with an ear to hear. And you're all invited uh, not to, because most of you are not really capable of benefiting from the information. So I, I don't really belabor that. I don't run a stock channel. Uh, there's a cottage industry in that emerging with uh, J Jeremy of a financial education. I call him the uh, Rocky Balboa of the stock market. Galileo Russell, of course, who tickles my sense of whimsy constantly with his hyperchange channel, which is a stock analysis channel um, that only has one stock, Tesla. Boy, that kind of gets next to my heart. And um, old Rob Maurer is uh, doing pretty well with his daily Tesla podcast. I would urge you all uh, to ignore these guys completely when it comes to your money. They have no idea what they're talking about. And it is very entertaining to watch them talk with such energy about it. Technology and disruptive stocks um, are a great place to play because you can make out shit pot of money on them if you're patient. They'll go up 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times, in some cases, your initial investment. But it's a different game. Uh, these guys are pawing through um, GAP and non-GAP and EBITDA and earnings and price earnings ratios, trying to put a valuation on companies that they ill understand because if they did understand them, they wouldn't be playing with any of that nonsense. <laughs> I've mentioned this and everyone thinks it's a joke, but earnings are an evil with um, high growth technology stock. 
If you have revenues that threaten to become earnings, delay them. And if you can't delay them and put them off till next year, immediately spend them on something, um, production capacity or marketing or uh, employee development or something that can aid and abet your growth because that's what the game is, is growth. I uh, did mention in August of 2017 that Tesla would hit $950 within 60 months. It was 19 months, as it turns out, and I tend to be conservative when uh, publicly airing uh, these kind of predictions. <coughs> In February of 2018, I took delivery of my Model 3 and immediately, uh, first, didn't really like the car too well, but did recognize that if you would extend me six months on my prediction, I'd bump it to $1,500. And all of you watched when I did a very uncharacteristic thing I never do. On January 4th, I warned you of an extreme volatility in Tesla stock and uh, how to play a uh, bracket or a straddle using way out of the money, low cost um, put and call options. To my embarrassment and chagrin, and I did do a video on January 12th and then again on the 29th, I proved the concept that it's better to be lucky than good. But you do need to be in the right position to get lucky. And Tesla stock exploded, rising from 404 to $969 while I'm holding 300 contracts for March, uh, February 20th and another 100 for March 20th um, call options, netting about two and a half million dollars. So let me explain to you a little bit of my philosophy of uh, high growth um, disruptive technology stocks. And I was there really at the IPO of Amazon.com, at the IPO of Google, um, at, uh, well, at the IPO of Apple and through several of its cycles as they uh, shit can Steve Jobs and then begged him on their knees for him to come back. And Apple stock, um, but I've done well with Cisco Systems in their heyday and Garmin uh, and a number of um, high growth technology stocks. EBITDA, gap and non-gap earnings and price to earnings ratios are absolute nonsense. Don't even spend your time looking at them again Earnings are an evil. They are to be avoided at all costs and endured under the rubric that you can't hit zero. So you're going to have some earnings or some loss. And the way the world is, it's better to have some earnings than some loss. Although if you have a good story, you can raise capital at the wave of a finger. And so what is important? The number one thing is the size of the market you are disrupting. Now, if you've developed the most fantastic machine available that's truly disruptive to break into um, adornments for cockatiel cages, you have to understand that's a pretty limited market. So if you get 100% of it, you still don't have much. 
if you've developed a search engine for an internet that's uh, growing 2,500% per year and likely to continue to do so for the rest of your life, that's a pretty big market. Um, if you're proposing to do online book sales, the uh, market for the sale of books in generally is actually quite huge. I uh, myself have spent tens of thousands of dollars on books over the years, and that's a pretty big market. If you want to expand that to online sales of everything, that gets even bigger. And uh, if you succeed, <clears throat> you basically kill off malls across the country. Similarly, telephones, computers, uh, etc. And so the number one thing I look for if you're going to disrupt a market is, is it, a, is it a market big enough that anyone would care? The second thing I look for is a product offering. If I buy an iPhone and I like it and it improves my life, that's a big plus. Um, if I take the whole Apple ecosystem with the iCloud and the laptops and the desktop computers, uh, that starts to get even better. And so it's a product I like and I use. And at this point, about a third of what I buy at all, I buy from Amazon. It often seems that I'm having stuff delivered on my porch before I can get up from the keyboard from ordering it with Amazon. That's excellent execution. And I like that product. <sighs> and so it goes. Um, so a large market and a good product offering that makes a difference in people's lives is important. The third element if you want to study numbers, is a um, high growth rate in unit sales and gross revenues from year to year. And if you get into an area of exponential growth where it's doubling or better um, year to year in both revenues and unit sales, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, that's what you're looking for, is growth. When you're examining growth stocks, you want growth. You don't care about revenues at all. Revenues is an opportunity to send the United States government more money to spend on more silly things. And finally, uh, I look for, uh, I guess, a combination of leadership and execution at the center of every successful entrepreneurial activity, as I've mentioned several times, is an autocratic, over-controlling, obsessive-compulsive, detail-oriented uh, asshole. And if you don't have one running the company, don't buy that stock. Uh, in order to lead, you have to be able to win. And in order to win, that's what it takes. And when I look at Jeff Bezos, or Steve Jobs, or um, Elon Musk, um, that's what I see, is uh, excellent leaders who uh, pretty much ask way too much of themselves and very nearly too much of all those around them, and that's how that works. So you need an environment with a big blue sky, a big market to go into, you need a product offering that actually um, and substantially uh, changes people's lives for the better. Um, you need uh, growth year to year, demonstrated growth, and you need uh, leadership that can execute. I don't care if they can call which seat of the stands they hit the home run into, but I do want somebody that hits home runs. And so that Elon Musk misdates um, 
and uh, Jeff Bezos misses projections uh, doesn't have any effect on me at all. Uh, but they do have to hit home runs, and these guys do it. Tesla, I actually have for years proposed a merger between Apple and Tesla. Apple lost Steve Jobs, and the man who inherited leadership of the company is an accountant. And he's a very good accountant, but he's not a leader. His idea of innovation at Apple is to move into medical monitoring with their devices. That's not a big market, and it doesn't uh, excite very much. So they lost their leadership, but they had a huge amount of capital laying around. And here's Elon Musk, who is uh, probably more of a visionary than Steve Jobs was, uh, easily as difficult to get along with, and um, who has a talent for spending money uh, beyond anybody I knew, even among the ex-wife uh, class. Um, so he's, uh, he's well uh, able, and so I thought they should merge. One of the reasons is, if you suffer exponential growth for long enough, you run into the law of big numbers. And that is to double in size, if you're doing a million dollars a year, you have to find a million dollars of new business. If you're a billion dollars in revenues in order to double next year, you need to find a billion dollars of new business. In other words, sell the billion you did this year and another billion of new business. And when you get to $10 billion, if you want to double next year, you have to maintain your $10 billion and find another $10 billion. And this is called the law, the cruel law of large numbers. And Apple ran up against this, and in the fields they operated, they become such a high um, percentage of capture of the market that there's not really any place to go. And so they need new markets. What does Tesla represent? And particularly if you combine Tesla and SpaceX in one deal, is a global satellite internet, a brand new internet 2.0 that reaches everywhere on Earth at gigabit bit speeds. Um, a unlimited blue sky in um, solar rooftops and battery storage and a pretty much unlimited uh, blue sky in automobiles. Apple wasn't in any of these fields, so they can't be criticized, much less brought to court on um, anti-competitive practices because they don't dominate any of those fields. In fact, they're not even in any of them. And so a merger of Tesla and Apple has always made sense, still does today, but the people involved can't get out of their own way long enough to do that. And so I still don't think it'll happen, but in a perfect world, it would. Um, Tesla right now uh, has been, I'm actually surprised at how lame the rest of the automotive industry has been and how little competition they've offered at this point. Uh, I've got GM and Ford and Volkswagen and Fiat and Daimler uh, all marked down as uh, uh, bankrupt companies uh, going into the future. I would bet Toyota somehow finds a way to survive. Uh, but Tesla simply owns the future of automobiles. The concept of solar roofs is the correct one. And by that, I don't mean solar panels on the roof. I mean a roof that has uh, got a, a long and durable life and uh, generates electricity. And Mr. Musk's concept of this is exactly on point. His Powerwall concept 
is basically what we've been doing in here in a much more artless fashion here. Um, but it is the uh, battery storage component for solar power and reaches for the uh, concept that I advocate now, which is the point of use generation and storage of electrical power from sunlight. So where does all that go? Uh, Jack, what you, what's your next move? What are you gonna do? Well, I've had a couple of problems in the past, most notably in 2001 and 2008. While I'm all focused on my stock picks and their exponential growth and their product offerings and their revenues and unit sales, and their market. I got taken out by what I call side winds. These are unexplainable panics in the market by the bovine group of other investors who operate only from fear or greed. The greed being a fear variant. So they're really operating from fear or fear. And um, these hurricane side winds have nothing to do with me. They have nothing to do with the profits of the companies I'm following or their future prospects or their execution. But it doesn't matter the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater because of the tsunami or the side winds that come in in the market itself. And that, um, nearly enough wiped me out in 2001 and I built it all back up and it got me again in 2008. Monday and there's no real news the coronavirus story has been out there for two months but Monday it hit the stock market and I awoke to uh, a Dow uh, futures um, at five or six o'clock in the morning that was down a ridiculous amount, 400, 500 points. And I watched the market open and it did immediately fall uh, a pretty good amount, a couple hundred points. And then it looked like it was recovering a little bit in the first 20 minutes. And then that support collapsed and um, the stock market opens at 8.30 here at, uh, in Central Time. And so by 10 till 9, I had sold all stocks in everything. I kept one share of Apple, one share of Amazon, uh, one share of Enphase, one share of Tesla, and one share of Uber, um, and one contract for Uber, and one contract for Tesla um, on call options, and about 30 contracts that I had laid in uh, for puts on Tesla at $550. The rest of it went into cash. The market went down 1,025 points that day, uh, Monday. It's Tuesday, and let's uh, have a peek here. Uh, oh my goodness, we're down another thousand points today, another 3.15% on the Dow Jones. Tesla's at 799, not too bad. In phase at 50. Um, Apple at 288, and so it goes. So I expect to wake up tomorrow and it fall again. I'm 100% in cash other than one share in everything so I can watch what it does in my E-Trade account. <coughs> Is that the right move? You know, I don't know. If you're long-term Tesla, you'll be fine just sitting on your Tesla whole shares. Um, 
But man, I, after 2001 and 2008, I'm a little butt sore on these uh, big collapses of the stock market due to news. It's not that I don't understand it. The people that are trading on it don't understand it. But it doesn't matter. They're going to do what they're going to do. And it's going to take the baby out with the bathwater. And so Monday morning, 20 minutes after the open, I went to an all-cash position. And if it appears to bounce, and that's often called a dead cat bounce, it will recover a little bit, and it'll go on down again. As the hysteria over the coronavirus continues. So if you want uh, what I'm doing, I own cash right now. And if I can see a way clear where coronavirus has run its course, uh, at least in terms of the stock market, I'll be in an excellent position to buy in the same stocks at a much lower price. Coronavirus, what do you want to know about that? Viruses are a ribonucleic acid uh, replicator, an RNA replicator. That's a single strand, sort of a simpler version of the deoxyribonucleic acid DNA. And they make very bad copies of themselves, most of which die and a few of which mutate into even more uh, vicious uh, versions of the virus. The virus can only exist in a host, and it has to be in a host cell, uh, really, to exist for any length of time. A virus outside of a person or a pig um, is um, kind of um, has a 45-minute to an hour life span. They, they don't live outside of living hosts. They can only replicate in another cell and they, they sort of subvert the cell's uh, production um, abilities to um, mm, reproduce the virus, which can then infect other cells and turn those into little virus factories. And so it goes, but they can't really live outside of that environment. We have never, not once, not even a little bit, in the history of mankind ever cured anybody from a virus. Now, you can believe that or not believe it, I don't care. We've never once cured a virus or any one of a virus. It's never happened. Um, we have some tools. Um, we can uh, vaccinate you uh, against a virus uh, in its current form, which does very little to uh, protect you from its future mutations. But if we take uh, some of the current virus and run it through a blender and kill it and then inject it into your body, the reason a lot of people survive viruses is not through our excellent medical care system, but because of their own immune system. And within um, a few days, in the case of a cold, or a couple of weeks in the case of the influenza, virus, um, and the coronavirus is essentially another mutation of influenza. Um, the, uh, in the case of that, uh, it takes uh, two weeks uh, pretty much to develop a T lymphocyte, um, T cell lymphocytes, which uh, detect cells that have the virus and kill the whole cell. Kill it and eat it and, and dispose of the debris. 
And so this is the process where you would get coronavirus or influenza and you would be sickened by it as it builds its population until the body has time to correctly identify it and develop T lymphocytes to um, kill it. Once uh, it does this, it doesn't like fight it off to a draw and they all start singing kumbaya. It continues until it's eliminated every cell in your body that has that virus. And so the virus is dead, gone, excreted in parts and pieces, um, dismembered. The, uh, in populations, uh, particularly virulent versions of it, such as the coronavirus, simply inoculate enough people around them to kill themselves off. If you had a set population of a thousand people and the virus killed a hundred of them and it infected the other 900 but didn't kill them, at the point where it's out of people that it hasn't done one or the other, the 900 can't be a carrier of the virus. They'll kill any entrant of that mutation immediately because they already have the T cell lymphocytes. The ones that are dead, viruses can't live in dead cells. When you're dead, you're dead and the virus dies with you. And so at some point you would say, well, the virus has run its course. No, it has to have a vector to survive. They're a parasite. And when they run out of hosts, they're done. It actually dies off. It's not like they diminish. All of them die and there's none left to carry on the, um, the strain. <coughs> of course, in a global pandemic, um, it can be very hard to quarantine this to a thousand people. But we eventually get over it because so many people have gotten it. You can go to the John Hopkins dashboard for the coronavirus and take a look at the numbers. Every discussion of them that I've seen appear to be nonsense. We have 70,000 people who have gotten the virus and 2,700 who have died from it. And so titty blonde news reporters would have us believe that it has a 2.1% fatality rate. When you get the virus, we don't know what's going to happen. You'll either die or you'll get over it. That's the two options. So on the far side to the right, we see that 27,000 people have recovered and 2,700 people haven't, they've died. That's a 10% fatality rate, and it's what makes the coronavirus very feared. Influenza has a fatality rate as well, about 0.1%, 0.17, I think, in the 19-2020 version of the flu we have going on right now. It's about 0.17%. The coronavirus, they're not telling you how bad it is. It's about 10% fatal. You have 27,000 people who have recovered, you have 2,700 who died, and then you have a whole bunch of people that have it, but we don't know the outcome yet. And that's just the numbers as best as they have been reported. Now, is President Z telling us the truth? Is President Trump telling us the truth? Are we getting actual factual data? You know, I don't know. I would probably bet against it. But while you're being very critical, put yourself in the position of a national leader of any country, of any size, anywhere in the world, and you've had an outbreak of coronavirus, this 10% fatality rate. What should you do? You know, I'm a pretty bright guy, and I don't know what I would do. And I'm a very honest guy, 
and I do know that I would lie about it. <coughs> For a whole host of reasons. But we do know from disease outbreaks in the past that life goes on, people buy stocks and people sell stocks, and this too shall pass. And we'll be fine except for the ones of us that are dead. In my belief system, they're even finer. So it's all good. I'm okay with the coronavirus. I have such a uh, diminished uh, lung capacity from 50 years of camel cigarettes that only two things could happen to me in the event of a coronavirus. One is it probably couldn't get through all the tar and nicotine to infect me at all. Or two, it would kill me within a day or two. And I'm okay with either one. So that's the coronavirus as best as I know it. But while you're being critical about what should be done and what shouldn't be done, uh, put yourself in the position of someone at a national level who is not um, a, a polymath and who uh, does not have intensive medical training. Um, and what would you do? And why would you do that? Understanding that every word you say and anything you do do can have a lot of implications to stock markets and supermarkets um, and the population and their hysteria um, based on your leadership. And so uh, I am not critical of Z, Trump, or anyone uh, about how this is handled. Do the best you can, and we will uh, survive it just fine. If all else fails, everybody will get coronavirus. 10% of them will die. The rest will be immune, and the virus will die. That's not to say that we won't get another one in a year or so, or a flu mutation almost every year. But hopefully one with a, not the fatality rate of this one. Uh, this happened in uh, 1917 and 1918, and um, it was a particularly um, vicious mutation. Um, it was a coronavirus. Co coronavirus is kind of a generic term of a virus that looks uh, like a crown, which all influenza viruses do. Where did it come from? You know, I've been startled by this. Uh, traditionally, we get uh, new strains of flu from birds or pigs. And half of the pigs in China died six months ago. And nobody knows why they died. But no one's made the connection between the human coronavirus and the un... I've never heard of such a thing before, where half the hogs in a country die within a few weeks, very suddenly, from a vet respiratory illness, uh, and nobody knows what caused it. But uh, that's what happened in China and pork in Beijing is 15 bucks a pound U.S. Uh, right now because of it. They're, one of the reasons we did a trade agreement in January was the Chinese finally had to because they wanted our pigs. <laughs> Believe it or not, it got down to that. They wanted pork. And so uh, the... Uh, but anyway, uh, the coronavirus is what it is, and uh, it is going to have an economic impact. Uh, we can't get some products from China right now because temporarily they're shut down. It will run its course, and life will return to normal. Um, but in the meanwhile, we've had a panic hit the stock market and it doesn't have to make sense. 
You see, once they start selling, people want to escape the drop in stock price of equities they own, and so they sell too. And so you have a wave of panic buying or selling uh, based on not wanting to be the last one left with worthless stock. Uh, this works the other way. In fear of being left out, when the market's rising, everybody wants to buy uh, so they can make some of that money too. And so it operates on alternate uh, waves of fear and greed. And it has nothing to do at that point with uh, individual stocks and certainly not EBITDA and GAAP. And uh, so that's my treatise on tech stocks in general, Tesla stock in particular. I still see nothing but an enormous area of blue sky for Tesla, primarily in uh, solar um, and battery storage of solar energy and the automotive. And um, I mean, they're just now getting into SUVs and pickup trucks, which are the largest selling segments of automobiles, and they've never had one in either one of them. Uh, in a $85, $90 billion market a year, um, you know, they're doing a fraction of that, a very small percentage of it. So they have unlimited room to growth, to grow, demonstrated um, impressive growth rates, uh, the ability to execute plenty of capital, and, um, and they keep uh, dipping into exposing new blue sky areas, such as automobile insurance. As I said in the last video, they already have all the machinery to do individual rating in automobile insurance based on your driving habits, and they already have the data. Ride sharing, Uber, Lyft. Uh, if you got to pick Uber or Lyft or Tesla to give you a ride, which would you pick? Which would you pick if the Tesla ride costs more? Same answer. We already know how this comes out. That's whole industries that Tesla isn't even in, that they have unlimited blue sky in. And so when Kathy at ARK Invest talks about five or $10,000 per share Tesla stock, I'm not laughing at her. It's entirely possible. Uh, it, at this point, it's kind of probable. Now, I do think they should split the stock several times to achieve some granularity and relieve some of this volatility, but there's no doubt about where it's going. But for this week, it's going without me because of the side wind or tsunami of overall market dynamics that have nothing to do with Tesla. They have nothing to do with Uber. They have nothing to do with Enphase. I don't care. I've, I've been on this rodeo before. When the herd stampedes, you don't want to be in front of it. And so let the cattle all run themselves out in their hysteria over uh, another virus, as if that's the first time it's appeared on Earth, and let them all run themselves out. And then we'll go in and see if we can have a little ribeye dinner. Stay with us. I'm Jack Rickard, and this is Electric Vehicle Television, as it has been for some time. Stay with us.